introduction and for the opportunity to speak here. So the, uh, the topic of this talk is a slightly adventurous conjecture about a relationship between knots and cleavers. Um, and the relationship goes as follows. So if you have a knot, um, you can compute its complete PT polynomial. Um, which we've almost met this week, I guess. Um, so this is somehow the large n limit of uh, the Reshetikin derived SLN polynomials uh, of this knot. Um, and once you have this, the phys physicists like to do. Okay, so once you have this, you can not only compute the standard Humphrey PT polynomial, but you can also compute colored versions. And we've seen lots of colors also this week. Um, and, and if you consider all the symmetric colors or all the exterior colors, what you can do is you organize them in a generating function, um, and then you do some kind of transformation of the generating function, and you recover LMOV invariants. Okay, so, so this is the first step, this is the second step. So this is some kind of transformation on generating functions. Um, and then it turns out that these LMOV invariants look very much like um, um, specializations of Motidicton's and Thomas invariants of Kleber. So let me add some more letters here. There's ET. Okay, so. Okay, and, and then, so these, those are invariants of, of Kleber. Um, and the, the conjectured correspondence is that, well, for every knot, you can find such a cleaver um, that this somehow commutes. Um, and one can even make uh, an even more adventurous conjecture. Um, because the way these, um, these, these, these motivic Donaldson and Thomas invariants are computed is they go by um, the cohomological algebra of this cleaver. And then these, uh, these motivic DT invariants are somehow uh, computed from the Hilbert von Gray series of, of this cohomological whole algebra. So this is somehow um, a refinement or a categorification. Um, and for the Humphrey polynomials, we also have some kind of categorification. So you can look at the colored triply graded homologies, and they. Um, they decategorify through the Humphrey BT polynomials, and you might think maybe maybe there's a relationship like that as well. Okay, so that's that's the upper plane. So and just just one quick question. DT it's really counting the uh, indie composable extension, right? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna define the basics. Oh, but, okay. Yeah, so um, <laughs> this, this is the outline. Okay, um, okay. And I'm actually I am actually gonna start. <laughs> 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 it's not the end of the talk. Okay, yeah. so the abbreviation LMLV before. Uh la vasida marino Okay. Okay. Yeah. This is good. <laughs> 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 okay, cleavers. Um so cleavers so uh Q uh, so yeah, my symbol for cleaver is Q. Uh my symbol for vertex set is I. Q vertices are labeled by IJ and other other letters. Um edges so there's an edge set, so run edges from i to j, this, okay, um, and then, um, okay, what are representations of Freeverse? Well, so two types of data, a finite dimensional vector space, say over, over C, for every vertex, so bi for every vertex in here, and for every edge, a, a linear map. So, um, a map at alpha um, from the i to the j, where we alpha from i to j. Okay, sure. And now, if you want to understand all representations of a cleaver of isomorphism, what you do is you um, Fix the dimension vector. So, <clears throat> fix some numbers which give you the dimensions of these, these vector spaces. 
um, the slightly shorter notation on D1 up to D, well, however many we need, <coughs> or just write this as a vector with underline. Okay, and then you consider the modulus phase MD, which is, well, so we want to parameterize all linear maps. For each of these linear maps, I need a, uh, I need a DI times NJ matrix. So I have a, so I all pairs of vertices, I and J, take a space uh, DI times DJ dimensional space of matrices. Um, but then I have to multiply by the number of edges um, from my to Sure. Okay. Um, but of course, there's a gauge group acting on this by basis change. Uh, basis changes in each of these standard uh, vector spaces. So here we have an action of, what's my name for this? GD, which is just the product. Of, of the GL DIs acting by conjugation. Okay, um, and so that on its own is quite boring, um, but what you can now do is um, for each of these dimension vectors, you compute the equivariant cohomology of this thing with respect to this group action. Say with rational coefficients, I think on its own is also not so, so interesting. But what is interesting is that, um, and that's the, due to Konsevich and Sorgelman, that if you form H, which is just uh, a direct sum of these HDs, the D ranges in and to the number of vertices. Um, then, then this admits an algebra structure. An interesting one. So this admits the rational cohomological algebra of that queen. result of, of a thema that says um, that if the quiver Q is symmetric, so what does that mean? Number of edges from I to J, number of edges from J to I. just n to the i graded, but it has an additional set grading. And if you twist the multiplication by a sign, or by some signs, uh, then, it's actually, then this is actually uh, free and super commutative. Um, so I put it here after twisting with the sign. is free super commutative <laughs> and generated by um, by a vector space, by a finite dimensional vector space tensor polynomial ring.
Okay, and if this is the case, then basically the only land of that thing is its uh, Hilbert point gray series. So let's write down this thing. So um, x will be a vector of, of variables x1 up to x number of vertices. Um, and now what, what am I computing? So I'm down. So here I'm summing over all um, n to the number of vertices and kz minus q to the minus k um, and then give the dimension of this d k graded piece because this is uh, graded by n to the number of vertices cross z um, and then I weigh this by x to the d and then what's the notation here? Well, so x to the d is x1 to the z1 times and so on, xi to the di. Um, okay. All right, and now in this case where the quiver is symmetric and this whole algebra is free super commutative, how does this thing actually look like? So it looks like this. Here we only sum over to the i, and then there's just just a portion minus q to some power, and the power is uh, given by the Euler form of a tuber um, evaluated at this vector d. And here downstairs you see a product of Pochhammer symbols, quantum Pochhammer symbols. So this was part one, so this is say, part two. Um, the Humphrey GT polynomial is 
It's not really a polynomial, but let's call it a polynomial. Let's call it a polynomial anyway. So its most basic version, the uncolored version, P1, this is the function that takes frame-oriented links um, in R3 or in R3 series you want to elements of the following ring, Laurent polynomial in A, and rational function in Q. And let's call this ring A. And this function is completely determined by, by, by local skin relations. Um, what other relations? So if you, um, you see a knot with a positive crossing, this Humphrey polynomial will be related to the same knot but with negative crossing inserted, um, adjusted by an error term polynomials where you insert a parallel resolution. The invariant of a single circle is one. So this is this is actually the reduced conflict polynomial, which is uh, normalized so that this holds. The invariant of the amount is one. And and this is a framed version which is yeah which is sensitive to framing changes. So if you have a randomized one like tangle here this one is uh, minus a inverse times the strand. Okay. So and uh, and what is this thing representation theoretically? So P one is the large n limit. Well, um, when, when n becomes very large, you can treat q to the n as an independent variable, and you call this variable a. Okay? And well, and the colored one, the colored, or say the wedge colored, uh, Humphrey PT polynomials are slightly more complicated to define. Um, so. Uh, this. So I'll put a J here, and then what you need to do is you take the wedge J color UQSL2, UQSL and ratio taking to arrive in variance and stabilize them in the blockchain. Okay. Right, and now I can state the, the first picture. later on. Uh, yeah, for everything L, there exists a symmetric cleaver Q and um, some vectors um, A, Q, and S instead to the number of vertices of this cleaver, such that. Well, so we form the generating function of this wedge j colored only polynomials. So we just sum the, the these colored Humphrey polynomials of the link L up, but we, we remember the color 
um, by placing this x to the j. And so the x rate is that, that this equals, so let's call this creep of QL because it depends on L. The conjecture is that, that you can get this from looking at this multiplicity T series of the creeper. But then, um, so this has lots of different variables, xi. So you need to specialize them in some, some way. And the way you specialize them is to send xi to minus 1 to, and then what comes here is determined by the entries of these vectors, si q to the qi, a to the ai, times x. So both sides in our power series in x. Uh, with coefficients in A. Okay. That's the first conjecture. Um, maybe, I don't know how you feel about this, but uh, um, maybe, maybe if you have such a power series, you can, maybe to satisfy some mild conditions, maybe you can always find a very large river that does the job. I, 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 don't, I don't know, I don't have any strong feelings about this. So the second conjecture is a bit more specific. So, uh, What's the evidence? Yeah, yeah, we're coming to that. We're coming to that. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So conjecture B. By the same people. Um, is the following. So for knots. You can do even a bit better. So um, again, it says there exists a quiver and there exists some vectors. And now you can write some kind of generating function as a specialization of the, Q, uh, of the DT series. Uh, but what this generating function on the left hand side is, is some partially reduced version of the color recombinant color variables. So you take PJ of K, but then you divide further by a quantum bottom symbol. Don't ask me why. But, but this, is, this is stronger than, than, than conjecture A. For not, uh, okay, so and the, the famous, this is um, a specialization of this thing in the same way. But now, now the interesting stuff comes. After a short break. So, and, and, and the interesting stuff is that the size of this river is, um, is somehow limited. Conjecture B continues. So the continuation is that the vertices um, of this cleaver QK associated to the knot are in bijective correspondence to generators. So a few remarks. A 
first one is um, so this is a uh, this is a stronger prediction than previous structural predictions about uh, color conflict polynomials. Just uh, knowing that these, these sequences are pure holonomial. Or just the, the LM will be structural results. Um, the origin <coughs> of this conjecture is, is in physics. Um, so uh, there is some an, an, an old idea floating around that if you, uh, if you do um, SUN, Turn science theory and you increase the, the rank, then in the limit you'll have some kind of relationship to topological string theory or Gromov um, or ET theory on a mathematical side. Um, but let me, let me say a bit more, I may remark a bit more about what this means. Uh, why, why should we care about this? Um, so, the large color. A large color behavior of, um, of quantum invariance of knots uh, is conjectured to contain quite a lot of information about the topology of the knot complement. For example, um, supposedly the large color behavior uh, can say something about the hyperbolic volume of hyperbolic knot complements. This is known as the volume conjecture. <coughs> it also knows about boundary slopes. <coughs> And the topology of incompressible surfaces in a knot complement. Oh, what was the first thing you know? It was about S. <coughs> what was the first thing? Uh, hyperbolic volume. Yeah. So, boundary slopes and topology of incompressible surfaces in the knot complement. This is known as the slope conjecture. Or the strong slope conjecture. Well, it knows about character varieties. Um, and the invariant cooked up from, from the SO2 character variety known as the A polynomial. So this is very much an, an SL2 story, but if you play this game for, for the Humphrey theory, then you can specialize to SL2. But if you stay on the Humphrey level, then I suppose that there's a relationship to not contact homology. <coughs> so and if this relationship with previous holds, then you might be able to attack some of these conjectures using uh, tools that take Weaver's input. Okay, um, maybe, maybe one more remark. So I think that at least conjecture A um, can be proved by results that are in the literature, which are due to Molik but only in the case when the link is algebraic, in the sense that it's a link of a, 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 of a plane curve simulator. So now I can say, um, 
Oh, and you, you asked about, James, you asked about uh, evidence, right? So, so in these papers, so they wrote two papers about this, uh, one for a, for a physics audience and one for a mathematical audience. <laughs> and, uh, and, and in, this, in, in the second paper, in the mathematical paper, they, they check this conjecture for knots up to six crossings, for torus knots in two strands, for the family of twist knots, and for a few other torus knots. Yeah. So yeah. A and B. Huh? A and B for what you said. Uh, they check A and B. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's a bad idea to erase the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so the result that comes next <coughs> is uh, is the result of joint work with Marco Sochic. Basically what we do is we, uh, we check these two conjectures for the class of rational things. And in case you're wondering, uh, no, rational links are not algebraic. In most cases. So here's the theorem. from three weeks ago. Translation um, A and B hold for for rational links or not. Conjecture B is but not. Okay, um, so, I wanna, um, so for the rest of the talk, I'd like to talk about the, the proof of this theorem. And so I should, uh, I should at least explain what, what rational links are. Okay? Before explaining what rational links are, I should explain what rational tangles are. So tangles are not fragments, um, and rational tangles are particularly simple not fragments that you can build in the following way. So you start, oops, you start with this tangle. So this is a trivial tangle. You should think about this as being embedded in a three-dimensional ball. Okay, and now uh, to build other rational tangles, this is a rational tangle, and to build other rational tangles, you're allowed to perform two types of operations. And it goes as follows. If you already have a rational tangle, which can be drawn inside this box, you can either perform operation T for top, which takes the thing and adds a crossing on the top, when you perform operation R, which takes the tangle and adds a crossing on the right. Okay. So if you um, if you consider these tangles that result from this procedure, and you consider them up to isotopy, which it allows points to move on the boundary two sphere of this three-dimensional ball, then all of these things will be isotopy to this guy. But so. The point is we don't do that. We restrict, uh, we, we constrain these boundary points to lie on a, on a sort of equator. And then these things will actually be, be different that result from, from this procedure. So why are they called rational? Because if you give me um, a rational number expressed as a reduced fraction, p over q, I'll write down the oops, I'll write down the continued fraction expansion or one continued fraction expansion of this rational number. Um, yeah, and so on. Minus one, minus two, 
and so on and so on, and it ends in, in 1 over a1. And we may assume that r is congruent 1 modulo 2, so this is an odd length continuing fraction expansion. Uh, if you give me such, uh, such a rational number and then you compute this continuing fraction expansion, what I can do is um, I, start, I start with this, this trivial tangle here, and now I apply A1 top twists. Okay? Then I apply A2 right twists. And I keep going. And if uh, the length of my continued fraction expansion was odd, I end with the number of top twists. I do A, R, top twists. Okay. And, and, and then, yeah, this is the, this is defined to be the rational tangle from P over Q. Okay, and it turns out that, um, that, that essentially these types of tangles that you get by, 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 by performing day twists on the boundary um, are, are classified by standard rational numbers. And so let me, let me restrict it a bit further. Um, we, so if this number is, is positive larger than 1, um, we can also assume that all the AIs are positive. Okay. And now what's a rational link? Well, they are simply obtained from a rational tangle by closing them up in this way. And they're almost classified by extended rational numbers. There's still some there's, there's some ambiguity in this control. Okay. So you see these these rational tangles can be built um, inductively, um, and so the hope would be that you can prove conjecture A and B basically by induction on the number of crossings. tomorrow at the MPI. Uh, I don't want to really draw people away from here, but if you're really interested in this, that's a chance to talk to one of the experts. that you can draw a link diagram where like the y coordinate is the most function and uh, then it only has two minima or two maxima. So in, in this in this sense the only one bridge knot is the unknot and well those are somehow the next level of complexity in this in this metric. So it's an it's an infinite family of links. Um, they're they're fairly simple as regards uh, invariance, but yeah, it's some, something other than Torah's name. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so the proof strategy. Um, the proof strategy is as follows. So, um, so suppose there uh, exist quivers not just for knots and links, but also for tangles. Tangles. 
and seconds, they grow in a controlled way. Under what? Under the operations T, R, and closing out. Okay? So if you have this, then, well, that's, that gives you an inductive proof of at least the first conjecture. All right. Um, so now I'm in a curious situation that I don't have to explain the whole Humphrey PT scheme theory anymore because we all know it already. So, but let me just say a little bit. The short way of saying, saying what the, how the Humphrey PT scheme theory works is uh, you take the S of N web or MOI graph theory that we've seen in, in several talks of this conference already, and then you replace all the Q to the Ns by A's. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay, this is a bit of a lie, but. Um, <laughs> so, if you have the one colored circle, usually you send this to like the quantum integer n. This is q to the n minus q to the minus n over q minus q inverse. Well, and then you said this is a minus a inverse q minus q inverse. Okay? So it's, 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 it's a lie also because I told you I want to set this to, to the q1. Okay, the, it's not, not false. <laughs> So, in any case, what, what is important is, is this crossing formula, right? So, the expression of the braiding in, in terms of this graphical calculus. So, here I'm, uh, I'm my, my, my color will always be denoted by J, and I will consider the same color on all link components if, there are, if there's more than one link component. And so, then this formula looks like this K0 up to J minus Q to the K minus J. Well, and then we have these funny ladder pictures. Uh, oh, well, okay. Yeah, I call it K. Now, um, J, J, and uh, but now you should be able to get some uh, label all the other edges. So, uh, J plus K, J minus K, and this is also K. Right? So, so this is this guy. Um, and now, if you want to compute the Humphrey PT polynomial of, of, of a link diagram, that's the first step. You take every crossing or replace it by such a linear combination of these graphs. Then you use some relation on these on these and the y graphs. Um, and if, if you start with a closed diagram, then you can reduce everything to basically a multiple of the empty diagram, and that coefficient is your is your Humphrey polynomial. So I'm not going to write down any any other relations because we've seen them already. Okay. Um, but what I want to say, all right, okay. But what I want to say is that um, we, we, so these rational tangles are oriented. So if you if you start with this tangle and apply the first top crossing, um, you see this picture, and you can expand this in terms of these these graphs. So. Um, what's behind this is that um, the, the scan modules um, for four-ended tangles have, um, have bases. And now, why, why, why am I using the plural? Because, well, if you perform these top and right twists, actually the, the boundary orientations will change. Um, and so, for every type of boundary orientation of tangle that I see in this process, there's a different scheme module. Um, scheme module just means linear combinations of those pictures modular relations. Okay, and, and in in the case where these orientations point upward, the basis elements look exactly like I've drawn over there. They're these, these webs, so 
We have J incoming at the bottom, J outgoing at the top, and then in the middle is this letter diagram and the label labels denoted K. And, and K is allowed to range between 0 and J. So these things, so now I'm saying something strong, I'm not just saying this crossing can be expanded in terms of them, I'm saying everything uh, with this boundary data can be expanded as a linear combination of those guys. Um, but, but when the, the boundary orientations are different, for example, if I now add a right crossing to this, I would see an outgoing thing on the top left and an outgoing thing on the, on the, on the bottom right. And then I need a different type of basis web Um, and it's this one, and then say I'm applying a top twist to this, then I will see all the orientations pointing to the right word. So, so then I will use a web that looks like this, or a collection of webs that look like this. And now, So the nice thing about this is that they're still all, so these spaces are still all G plus one dimensional. And those things somehow give a distinguished basis. Okay, and now uh, let me introduce some names for these guys. So I call this guy up JK. So up refers to the fact that the orientations point up. Um, J refers to the fact that the boundary is always labeled by J. And k is the index inside, inside the spaces. Um, and here I have, so this is called op because the strands somehow point in opposite directions, jk. And this I call right jk because everything seems to be pointing to the right. OK, consider um, the A module spanned by those guys. I think it was uh, this. Uh, ring of the wrong polynomials in A, rational functions in Q. So now, so the, the scheme theory philosophy says that if I have a picture in here and I apply uh, a right crossing, so I glue on a crossing to the right, I can resolve this in terms of, of elements here. So this right crossing operation gives me a linear, linear map from this game module to this game module um, and actually also reverse. Um, a top crossing will move me between those, those guys, a right crossing will preserve this, and a top crossing will preserve this scheme object. So, so now the whole scheme theory, the Humphrey scheme theory for rational tangles is now boiled down to knowing uh, six matrices. Um, six j plus one times j plus one matrices with entries in A. Okay, and there are explicit formulas. Can you say what is A? A is, A was, <coughs> A was this. All right, so we have explicit formulas for those. And now, how do you compute how do you compute the invariant of a of a rational tangle? Well, it's very simple. You um, just consider this guy as an element of this first scheme module, and you consider those guys as these linear maps. Okay. Um, right. And what do we know about these maps? Isn't it? So the main oh, let me write this here. So R and T, T and R, are, um, say, upper um, and lower triangular in these spaces. And a, and a special case you see here, so this is, the, the, this is T applied to the trivial tangle, which it's also known as T applied to up J0. And you see, if you, if you hit this element, then you recover somehow the new combination of all the others. And if you hit something which has a K here, then here you will only recover, you only have C coefficients for labels larger than K. That's useful. Because, oh, so 10 minutes. 
Okay, so now, once you know these, these matrices, then you can write down closed formulas for the color conflict polynomial of a rational ring. And that, that's something that was not known before, before this computation. So there is one summation index per crossing. Okay, so I'll start with a few top crossings, and I'll get, because of this triangularity, I get uh, an ascending sequence of summation indices. The last one less, less than j, or less or equal to j. But then I do uh, a number of right twists. So then I have a descending sequence of summation indices. Then I do some top twists, and I have an ascending sequence of summation indices, and so on. So, so there's a, a, a number of summation in the indices which is equal to the number of crossings in that diagram. They're constrained to be between 0 and j, and they sat satisfy this order in relationship. So that's, that's already quite awful. Um, then there's, there's some linear power. So there's a power of minus q, which is linear in these summation indices. There's a power of a, which is linear in these summation indices. There's a power of q that is quadratic in these summation indices. So that looks already good because um, so basically, we're looking for a formula that satisfies this. Uh, so these linear terms will come from the specialization vectors, and the quadratic terms will come from the, the adjacency matrix of the quiver. Okay, but then there's some other junk. Um, and oh, okay, and the, and the junk is like a bunch of um, a multinomial coefficients. Okay, um, and then there's even a quotient of some Pochhammer symbols. <laughs> okay, so so I don't want to give too much. Into so so okay. So the, the goal would be now to treat transform such such a uh, such an expression into a simpler expression. Because if we so, so if you can if you can write this as um, a sum over. Uh, Some summation indices which are which are positive but always not constrained. Minus q to linear, a linear, q quadratic, and then a single multinomial coefficient, j choose. Oh, we can here this I guess. Q to the, q to the um, a, a single multinomial coefficient, j choose the sum of the entries of this dimension vector, x to the j, then you're done. Okay, so the, the, the goal is to go from the other expression to this expression. And, and that's so possible. Done, but what is the quiver that you... Oh, you just read off, the, here you read off the adjacency matrix. So this is a purely quadratic expression in terms of these summation indices. Uh, and so you, you read all the entries into this of the adjacent. Yeah. Does it make sense? So, are you saying that I take any quiver, this generating function is what's the quiver always just has that form? Uh, yeah, if, if you. Well, it has. This divided by the, the quantum Pauhammer symbol of length j, yes. Okay. Yes, that, that's precisely what was in the, in the, in the second quarter. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, okay. 
okay, so and, and, and how, do you, how do you do this? Well, you, you don't do this transformation. You do this somehow step by step, one crossing at a time. But for that, you need to, need to understand what it means to have the free associated to a tangle, and I want to explain this now. Um, so, uh, what kind of, like, okay, so I'll, I'll reuse, I'll reuse this formula here. So, so now, this is for tangles. So for tangles, we have to do the following. Um, so first of all, the invariant of a, of a tangle will not be a polynomial. It will be a linear combination of such features, such waves, with coefficients being polynomials. So um, I shouldn't have uh, a, a, an x to the j here, but I should have, say, one of these, these waves. So this could be, this is in the set um, up, up, all right, and then here I have j, and here I have k, but now the, so somehow the cleaver has to encode not just one polynomial, but, but the j plus one polynomials. And the way this is done is by picking, um, by picking a subset of summation indices, and then this k, the indexing set for, for the web basis is the sum of the summation indices I say k in, in okay, is that, um, x in y in y and j dy. So you should think about this as having a creeper, but now the vertex set of the creeper is partitioned um, into two sets. One I call active, and one is inact, and one, one inactive. And so the active vertices determine the summation indices which go into, uh, which sum up to this variable k, um, and all summation indices are uh, sum up to, to the color j. And now, um, once you once you somehow formulate what it means uh, for um, for the evaluation of a tangle to be determined by such a quiver, you can inductively prove that such quivers exist. Um, so, so for for a trivial tangle, there is a quiver and it's just a single vertex. Okay, and I'm, I'm drawing these quivers in the in the uh, in the AQ plane for reasons I might be able to explain. Uh, in the right time. Uh, okay, and so, so this, is the, this is the start of the induction. That's, that's a simple quiver. And, and then if you have, so if the evaluation of a tangle is in quiver form, which means it's, it's of this form, um, then, uh, then so is top twist applied to, top, to, to, to this angle, and also right twist applied to this angle. And you can even say a bit more. Um, so, so if the number of active summation indices, those are the ones that sum to k, is alpha, and the number of inactive summation indices is beta, then this the creeper associated to this tangle will have alpha plus beta active summation indices and beta inactive. And, uh, and if you apply a right twist, then this will have alpha actives and alpha plus beta inactives. So maybe let me give an example. So this is, this is the creeper associated to the trivial tangle. And now if you would apply uh, a top twist, and this would correspond to a quiver with two vertices and no edges, um, looking like this. So now this has one inactive vertex, and this will have an active and an inactive one. And if you apply a right twist, um, oh, and so, so maybe if you, if you keep going and you apply another top twist, then um, the quiver will look like like this, and I will have 
two active vertices and one inactive. Or if you apply a right twist after a top twist, then we'll see the picture that it looks like. And there's still no, there's still no, no edges here. But if you apply a right twist after a top twist, then you'll see a more interesting quiver. So now it has, sorry, has three vertices, two of which are inactive, one is active, and you see even a bunch of a bunch of loops in these vertices. Okay, so let me wrap up by saying that um, once we <laughs> Once we, so somehow from the shape of these formulas, um, we can compute basically how this quiver grows if we apply a top twist or a right twist. Um, and and this, is a, this is somehow a funny operation on quivers, and I'm wondering if anyone of you has seen something like this before. Please tell me. Um, okay, but this, this immediately, then, then you need to check that under, under the closure operation, um, you go from a quiver to a quiver, and once this is done, you've proved conjecture A. Um, to con prove conje conjecture B is a little harder, and it takes up two thirds of, of the paper with Marco. Um, and for that, you need to um, you basically need to perform these operations of adding crossings in pairs and do some resummations in, in, in between. Um, and then you need to prove that this match somehow this this quiver has this nice relationship with uh, triplet graded homology. And to do this, we use a result of Jake Rasmussen, which says that the triple graded homologies of two bridge links are actually boring. Uh, <laughs> so they actually are determined by the colored Humphrey polynomial and the signature. Um, and then we prove that you can also read off the signature from the quiver and, and, and the relation hold. Okay, but uh, on the other hand, um, somehow both on the triple graded homology side and on the cohomology of all algebra sites, things can get a lot more complicated once you go past uh, uh, two bridge links or, or, or quivers, symmetric quivers with zero potential. Um, so there's somehow a lot more scope for generalization and, and so on. And yeah, I think, I think I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's what I want to learn. Um, oh, okay. I, yeah. That's exactly okay. No, if if I would expect some more something like this showing up in, in the in the, in the cluster world, but yeah, I, I don't know much about it. So if you, if you have any hints, let me know. I just thought I would talk about it somewhere, but I don't know much about it. Question. So I'm thinking more about this result you this FMOP result you mentioned. Uh -huh. It seems to indicate that the Generating series associated to a symmetric quiver is very constrained. Yeah. I mean, it's basically determined by a quadratic form. Mm -hmm. Is this is this special? Is this function? I mean, is it related to any other known special functions associated to quadratic forms, like like theta functions or something like this? I don't know much about it, but, okay. but I wouldn't be surprised. Okay. <clears throat> Do you expect? Um, uh, some reformulation of conjecture A and or B for tangles, since you, you define quivers for tangles. Uh, so I, so so we define what it means for um, the Humphrey scale module element of a tangle to be in this type of quiver form. Um, we can only somehow find these expressions for for rational tangles. Um, and, and, and there, this relationship holds, right, by construction. Um, so, yeah, maybe, it, what was your question? <laughs> yeah, so, do you, you think that, the, I mean, do you think it's possible to formulate the conjecture A and or B for triangles? Uh, yeah, I mean, for a conjecture A, you would just say such an expression exists for every four end of triangle. And for a conjecture B, I have no idea. Um, is there any hope that one can go backwards from first to the or then? No, I don't think so. Um, uh, so. So it's apparently not clear at all whether there should be only one quiver or not. 
And, and in fact, uh, somehow in rewrite, so if you do this naive thing and you just rewrite these generating series, there are some choices that you can make, and the query that comes out will depend on these choices. Are they related by computation? Uh, really yeah, that's also something that I would like to understand better. Um, but, but, but it's, yeah, so it's strange. So one thing that I should mention is that um, conjecture, I mentioned that conjecture P is harder to prove because you have to do some immediate uh, resummations. It turns out these resummations only work if you're, um, if you're very consistent in the choices that you make uh, in, in rewriting this one. So it's not, there is some, some indication that the queries that we get are distinguished. Because otherwise we couldn't do these resummations. And this quadratic uh, power of Q is just corresponding to adjacent symmetric? So yeah, that's right. And so, so but only after resummation? Uh, after resummation? Uh, after, well, rewriting your formula on the top to get the one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This, this, is, this, is where, this is where the paper comes in, and these are these other specialization vectors. And so, in particular, the, the growth of these polynomials in Q is completely determined by a quiver. So everything that concerns somehow the, yeah, the growth of, these, uh, of the maximal coefficient uh, of the maximal power of Q in these polynomials is completely captured by a quiver. So you should be able to see boundary swaps in the quiver. Okay, uh, what do we... Uh, what, 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 what question? Are there any expectations of this kind of quantum invariance? So other quantum invariance? Like, like what, for example? Like for example? Oh, oh, okay. That's also a good question. Um, so here, this is formulated for the wedge color, conflict polynomials. But there's a really easy operation that you can do to transform this into symmetric colored uh, conflict polynomials, mm -hmm. uh, which is just like inverting Q. And, and, and a sign. And if you have that, you can specialize a to q squared, which will still be linear. And so you get a quiver which governs basically the, the generating function for the color Jones polynomials. And so this is, this is automatic, that's included. Yeah. Okay, why don't we thank Paul once again for the last talk? <laughs>